You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We have a great guest today. We've got a great series of conversations, and I want to introduce you to Christine McKay, who, to my way of thinking, is the best negotiator we've had on this show, even though we've had Chris Voss on a couple of years ago. So Christine is a a great negotiator to help businesses get through those sticky points where people aren't quite on the same page. She helps them get on the same page, get an agreement and move forward. So welcome, Christine. Thank you so much for having me, Will. I am so excited to be here. I love your show. Your guests are just incredible. It's just an honor to be here. So thank you for good. having me. Well, good. So tell us, tell us, what are you seeing out in the business world today with all this craziness that's going on? It just seems like uh, we're living in a fantasy world and sometimes it's a dystopian fantasy, but we're nevertheless, it seems like we're making it up every day. So what are you seeing in your world of negotiation? Oh, well, I'm seeing a lot of businesses being sold. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of people kind of, um, for lack of a better f- term or phrase, kind of aging out of their companies and not having a place to sell it. Um, I'm mm-hmm. seeing a lot of people who want to sell but aren't actually prepared to sell. Um, and then I'm actually seeing a lot of issues, and this is not going to be a shock to anyone tuning in. Um, I'm seeing a lot of supply chain issues, a lot of things, uh, a lot of relationships that people thought that they had in place that they're going, holy crap, that isn't what I'm not, I, I did, what I thought I had is not what I actually have. And so those are kind of the big, those are the big things that I'm seeing right now in my universe. Well, are, are you seeing people when they get that, holy crap, I didn't expect that to happen. That's not happening. Do you, uh, it seems to me that there's two things they can do. One is they can say, therefore, I'm going to sue them. The other one is, okay, so they probably have as big a problem as I do. Therefore, I'm going to spend my time, energy, and resources figuring out how to solve the problem. Which do you see people doing? So I see people trying to renegotiate. So we usually get involved before the whole I'm going to sue them conversation starts to happen. Um, I'm a huge fan of renegotiation. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, negotiation is a conversation about a relationship. And you cannot win a relationship. And, you know, before we started recording, I was making a joke about, you know, my husband, but my husband is amazing. And we've been married for almost 30 years. And the, but the relationship that we had that when we first got married is not the same relationship we have today. But when we get into business, we sign a contract and then we think that that's going to govern it. Right. And the reality is, is that relationships happen, happen, life happens, life happens in our business. And situations come up. And if we don't create an environment that allows us to have conversations, hard conversations sometimes about the state of our relationship in business or even in our personal lives, then at the end of the day, we're not going to, we're not going to be successful because if you get into a relationship where you are going to, you hit that point and you're like, I'm just going to sue them. Uh, you're you're going to lose more, not just, you know, the lawyers are going to gain a lot, but you're not going to gain as much. And so I am all about how do you either rebuild a relationship or build a relationship that allows for flexibility where the contract becomes a guide to the relationship, but it is not the, it's not, it's not the the red, the letter of the law kind of thing. It's like you, you create flexibility that allows you to grow as a business and also contract. And sometimes the right decision is it's best for us to part ways, but how do we do that in a way that actually makes sense? And that's not at full of animosity and angst, but how do we do that in a way that's productive? And there are absolutely ways of doing that. Well, that's good to hear because what, what I'm looking at is, when I think of where we are today in this country, we really have to renegotiate, don't we? Mm. 
I'd even right. take it a step further. We first have to allow ourselves the, we have to make ourselves willing. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, That's yes. The first but, step. I mean, but well, I mean, I talk about steps, but I was just saying right now, to me, I've been looking at this for a couple of years now and, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. And, and so I'm thinking about what is it that's get it going on here? And I think one thing that's going on is, is we are generalizing and turning people into talking points or, or points on a graph rather than human beings. I agree. I and, agree. And so, so yes, I agree. You have to both want to, uh, at the same time, at the same time, you don't have to wait for the other person to want to as well. If you want to, you can begin, it seems to me, you begin to do some things that create the possibility for that renegotiation. And, and I think one of the first things is if, if I want to renegotiate, whether it's, you know, a cultural level or a personal level, and, and by the way, didn't you say you've been married 30 years? Almost, yeah. Well, well uh, you, uh, we got 14 more years on you, and it's <laughs> still renegotiation. It is. It's constant right. renegotiation. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in thinking about that, it seems to me that one of the first things we do is we recognize that we can only talk to human beings. All right? And, and, and that means we have to have a relationship with them, and we have to recognize that they are different from us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what, whatever comes out of this renegotiation or this negotiation process is not going to be all for me and it's not going to be all for them. There's going to be something else. I don't know that we have to talk about compromise, but we do have to talk about building a place, building a page that we're both on, coming to an agreement. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm. I, yeah, it is. I mean, I just recently had uh, breakfast with somebody in Atlanta, and we had only ever met on Zoom during the pandemic through a networking group that we're both part of. And, you know, it turns out he's he was born and raised in Moscow and, you know, and lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and he has certain political ideologies. And, you know, I'm from Montana. I grew up in a rural community in Montana, but I live in Los Angeles. Which which one? It's called Big Sandy. We have two claims to fame. One is that one of the senators is from my hometown. My parents can't stand him. But um, (laughs) so if you look up which senators and you think about Montana, you'll figure out who, which one that is. And the second is that the bass guitarist and co-founder of Pearl Jam is from my hometown. And of course, I'm from my hometown. So there we got, we have three claims to fame. That's the most Um, important. But the thing, the thing that was really interesting about the conversation that he and I had is that it became clear that we absolutely have some different political ideologies and philosophies, but we also have a lot of things in common. And what people, I think, you know, to your point, I think that for me, the thing that we've lost in that in our culture for me is curiosity. We're no longer curious about ourselves enough to explore what are the reasons why we think the things that we think? What's the rationale behind our own perspectives? What's driving that philosophy? It's instead, we've quit, we've quit being curious and we want somebody to tell us what to think. And then we're also not curious about anyone else. We've, so we're, we're letting somebody tell us what to think and not being curious about ourselves. And we're not creating an opportunity for other people around us around us to share their different perspectives. So this gentleman, right, from Moscow, right, grew up in a communist society, grew up under all of that. And I'm a product of the Cold War. And my one of my daughters lived in Serbia for a, a while, and I went to visit her. And I was struck by, you know, the impact of propaganda. I didn't realize the sun shined in Serbia. Now I'm an incredibly well-educated woman, right? (laughs) And I'm incredibly well-traveled. And I go to the Eastern Europe for the first time and I'm like, oh my God, it's gorgeous here. The sun shines. We have a perspective. 
some of that perspective we were told to have, and some of it we develop from our own experiences. But that's the beautiful thing and the thing that I love so much about negotiating is perspective. This gentleman's perspective, what he sees as right wing versus left wing is different than what I see, which is different than what my friends and colleagues in Canada see, which, and we're all different. And when we are in any conversation, and like I said, negotiation is just a conversation about a relationship in business, not in hostage negotiations, like you're not going to have a long term relationship necessarily with a hostage taker. And I'm sure that's something Chris would agree with. But in business, it's not hostage negotiation. And if you're negotiating in your business like you do a hostage situation, you got bigger problems to deal with. Um, go it, ahead. It, it, it isn't, isn't the things that you're talking about that are a lack of curiosity. It seems to me that comes because we're afraid. Yes. We're afraid of the other. Now, let me ask you, is it necessary to help a, negoti a, a, a party who is in negotiation to move beyond fear from scarcity to abundance to a place where, you know, it's going to be okay. He's not out to get me. It's going to be okay. We're looking for a way to not just survive this encounter, but to thrive. Yes, absolutely. I love well, that. The, because abundance, we research shows that we tend to go into negotiations believing that our counterpart is out to get us. They're, and we got to get them before they get us. But that, that fear mentality and, and, and negotiation is very triggering for a lot of people. And a lot of the research our team is doing is showing kind of where those triggers come into place. And so when we go into it fearful because we're afraid of being judged by our counterpart and we go into it not trusting that our counterpart has our interests in mind as well, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's what leads us into court situations and highly, you know, acrimonious breakups, whether it's personal or professional. But when we go into a negotiation, asking like my favorite question to ask in a negotiation, it, even when we're just about to close the deal is, okay, we've got some place, we've gotten some place that we think is really great. Now, how do we make it better? How do we make it better for each of us? Right. It's an it's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to sit at the negotiation table and tell your counterpart, I trust you. I trust that this relationship is going to unfold in a way that's going to be beneficial for both of us, because there is more. And there's actually research that shows that for most people in a negotiation, they leave 42 percent of the value of whatever the deal is untapped because they're so focused on just my little pie of a, you know, my little pie is worth a hundred. And if you get, if you get 10, then that means there's only 90 left for me. When in reality, the pie is actually 142. What would yeah. it look like? What yeah. would it look like if you went into every deal going, how do we figure out together? How do we, we think that there's a hundred, but there's 142. Let's find, let's discover we have to trust. 42. We have to trust. We have to trust. We do have and to trust. It seems to me that, that, I mean, Patrick Lencioni talks about the trust. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that whole triangle that, that we work so hard on in EOS every year. Mm -hmm. Do we have to read this book again? Absolutely. Because the five dysfunctions of a team have to do with building trust, which is how you make all the rest of it work. Absolutely. And, 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 and that trust to me is not, is, is not just, I, it's not just, I trust that you're going to do the right thing. It, it really has to do to my way of thinking that I am not afraid of you, mm. and not from a macho, that you can't do anything to me, but you know, I'm not afraid of what's going to happen in our relationship. The thing is, though, I, I love that. And the thing is, though, is that so many of us are unclear on who we are. If we just and, and one of the things I loved in our first conversation, well, and is, I mean, you're, you're curious about you, but it, people don't spend enough time being clear on who they are and what 
what they want out of things. So they have the superficial view and because they're not centered, they, they're not, they're not like comfortable. They can't like sink into themselves as a warm blanket, you know, uh -huh. and when you can do that, then you don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be afraid of anybody because you know that that person is not there to rob you of who you are. You are who you are and they're a compliment to you. I just recently, and I have no problem. I hope it's okay to disclose this. I just recently quit drinking and started and, um, and uh, have been going through um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And yeah. I just finished like my second step, which is figuring out how you define your spiritual world. And it uh -huh. was really powerful for me because what I discovered is I have this just incredible faith in humanity. And uh -huh. every single person who's lived, who is living, and who will who will live after after us, is is absolutely unique and can never ever ever be replaced. Well, that, and that's that that's that whole thing of taking them off of the talking points and off of the generalization. It's yeah. you're, you're you're a unique one of the nine billion people. You're totally different. Exactly. Just because you voted this way or that way doesn't mean you are all alike. Exactly. And when you when you look at yourself and you see the, and you appreciate that uniqueness and you vote for yourself, but you do it in a way that acknowledges, that respects and that honors that every other person is as unique as you in their own way, it creates an opportunity to create more, to be more, to do more, to have bigger impacts, to achieve more, to accomplish more, because it's we're unlimited in what we can do. But that's right. That, that that's the abundance. Absolutely, that's the abundance. And yes, and 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 it to me that abundance is my life is abundant. Mm. I, I am not bounded by death. Exactly. Right now, that could be I am not bounded by death because I I know where I'm going to go or I know that I will live longer than my death. Or it could be I'm not bounded by death because it's I'm not afraid of it. Whatever is going to be is going to be OK. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, 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 and and that that, you know, that fear that. You said earlier that we allow people to tell us. I think that becomes a way for people who need the control because of their own baggage, but they are trying to get control and they use the fear of death is a big one, disease, uh, bankruptcy, uh, war, uh, the loss of something. They use that fear to cause other people to then do what they are told to do. That's so funny that you mentioned that because I was literally just talking to somebody this morning about how you know we have created a culture where the fear of loss is greater than the hope for gain. Yeah. yeah. And how, how, how sad is that? When there's so much gain that we can hope for, when there's so there's so many possibilities if we just stop and and start feeling and that's something i talk a lot about is is feeling in negotiation right and this is something that i love that chris voss talks about around his his tactical empathy and i i like to take it even further and somebody was earlier today was saying you got to control your emotions and i'm like screw controlling your emotions feel your emotions you can't control how you feel you can control how you react to those yeah feelings. yes and that's exactly i had that uh I had a, uh, and I get called in, it's not called negotiation. It's called getting on the same page, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I've learned a lot from you and from Chris about this, but it's really people are not on the same page. And in order for them to have some balance, they have to be on the same page. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to do what they said they would do a year ago. It means what is the new page we're going to get on? And, and, and at the end, uh, the, the, it's amazing because it happens so many times. I mean, in, at the level that I'm working in, 
after you know an hour or two of the conversation when we have the breakthrough they get up and hug each other isn't that incredible yes and so we were debriefing i was debriefing with one of the one of the one of the two people there and and he said oh my gosh you are just a genius will and and he said and i said look it's it's really pretty simple when you get to the place where you're no longer emotionally involved, which I call being triggered, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, that's my word for being triggered. And he said, oh, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm and, he, and he, he used the word stoic before. And I said, that's not true. You are emotionally involved. You're trying to hide it by this stoicism, which doesn't help. You have to experience it and know it. But then you also have to let it go so that it doesn't control you. And right now it's controlling you. And that's where you guys got into this issue because when something happened, you didn't share your feelings. And now it's a year later and you're sharing your feelings and and you're throwing the whole kitchen sink on the table. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I said, you know, you didn't share your feelings. He didn't share his feelings. And, but now you guys are back on the same page. Now, you know, let's pay attention to that as you move forward. But, it really was this, this, you know, and, and I said, you know, this is where you get to go deep inside yourself over the next five to 10 years, and you will be a greater leader by doing it. I love and that. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's really amazing. powerful. That's so powerful because the thing is, is that, so I, I hear this all the time, right? Think this is just business or, you know, people like try to go, it's just logic. And I'm like, no. We're human it's beings. Math. We, it's just math. It's just math. Um, <laughs> we we feel before we think. We f- we feel something before we engage the logic centers of our brain, and so when and and I hear this all the time in negotiation. Right, I just got to shut down my emotion. I got to do, and I'm like, why not? No. Why not just name and label it? Yes. What what happens? In a conversation, whether it's with a spouse or whether it's with a business partner, a customer, a supplier, an investor, whatever, if it if you just say, you know, how that that made me feel this way, was that your intent? I was I, I just was in a negotiation a couple of weeks ago, and this this with with a guy, and which most of my negotiations with yeah. with men, but this particular gentleman. Um, made made a very inappropriate sexual call, comment, followed by the, I don't know why anybody would hire you as a woman to negotiate. <laughs> and so, right? So guess what? My feelings engaged first. <laughs> and yep. I'll let you figure out which emotion came up first. But my feelings engaged first. And then, but I noticed, right? I noticed the emotion that came up. And then I said, all right, that emotion is coming up. Now, what do I want to do about it? So I, right. by noticing the feeling and then I, asking myself the question, what do I want to do about it? I gave myself choice. And how I handled it was I said to the gentleman, I said, is it okay if I ask you a question? <laughs> and he said, oh, sure, why not? And he was, he was riled up. And uh, I said, what reaction were you hoping to achieve by making those statements? What do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, they were fairly inflammatory statements. So what were you hoping I would do? Oh, well, I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't mean anything by it. So now, right, so he was trying to rob me of my power in the conversation, Simply by noticing my emotion and pausing for a a second, a nanosecond to ask myself a question and then asking him a question allowed me to stay in control of my power. But what happens and what happens like in the situation that you're talking about is that when we don't acknowledge our emotions to ourselves, let alone to others, but when we don't acknowledge them to ourselves, we're actually giving up a piece of our power in those conversations. And, you know, it, we ended up moving beyond that conversation and we moved forward and we had a very productive conversation after that. But had I not 
asked him that question, had I not acknowledged how I was feeling and taken action based on it and made a, a choice not to let that emotion consume me, we would have had a very different outcome to that conversation. Right. My wife, my wife uh, uh, talks about naming it to tame it. I love that. Naming the emotion to tame it. Mm. And, 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 and that's uh, what I mean by not getting emotionally involved. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, what, what you're talking about, somebody robbing me of my power means that I am now afraid. I'm afraid you won't like me. I'm afraid you'll, you know, not hire me. I'm afraid that you you'll put me down in your head. That, that, that I'm afraid that I'm no longer at the same level of you, and and that's a fear. That's not something they did. That's my response to it. Absolutely. And then I get to choose what my next move is. It yeah. could be to cry. It could be to run away. It could be to walk out, slam the door. It could be to slam my fist on the table, or it could be to say, which I find just always the right thing. That's interesting. Could I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that to me is, is the most powerful thing that I can do. Curiosity, man, it gets us a long way. It oh, goes absolutely. So far. It goes so far in sure. Building yeah. relationships. Well, it, it, it goes far in building relationships. It goes far in, in getting people on the same page. Because if I'm curious about you, that means there's something I don't know about you. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm asking that question because I've got an agenda, that's a whole different thing. But if I'm really curious about what you said, did, or, 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 maybe caused me to respond well if i'm curious about it i'm recognizing that you are an agent you are a human yeah. being who has choices absolutely and if i'm curious about your choices you know that may be the only time that day that month that year that anybody has asked them i'm curious about mm -hmm. your choices I love that and because an age what to your point agency like it's so easy for somebody to take somebody's agency away or to feel like their agency has been taken away and yeah. we and I, I see that all the time in my, in my line of work when somebody you know does something or behaves in a way or says something in a way that the other party feels like their agency and their choice their ability to choose has been taken away um, and that it's so important to let people know that, you know, I, I actually often say that freedom starts with no. Now, which is contradictory to what a lot of people would say, you know, there's all the books written about say yes to everything. But for me, right, saying if, if I think about my yeses and nos as a river, right? So my yes is the water, that's the water that comes into my river and my no is the is the banks, right? If I start if I start saying yes to everything all the time, all the time, at some point that the water is going to overflow the, the banks, the boundaries that I've set. Now, in some areas my boundaries are, are stronger and more fortified than they are in others. Right. And there, you know, I have weak points along the way to, you know, that my river goes, flows to the ocean. Right. But when I'm really in flow on things and things are just, and, and my life is going in, in a really great direction and positive way, I know where my boundaries are because I've given myself the agency to say, say no to things. Right. And, you know, people are afraid of the word no. And when my kids were little, I used to say, what part of no do you not understand? The N, the O, or the two letters combined, <laughs> right? Um, you know, because the thing is, is that no, is it does two things. It gives you the power to say yes to the things that are fully aligned to you. And yeah. no also gives you permission to ask another question or the same question in a different way. What are people right. saying no to? Is it all of what you're proposing or is it just a piece of what you're proposing? And we tend to react by saying no without exploring what that no actually means. Um, 
Yeah. Well, it, it triggers, I think it triggers our fear of scarcity, mm. our fear of limitation, our mm -hmm. fear of, of a barrier. Uh, you know, uh, it's like saying death is the no to life. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's a decision that you make about how you deal, yeah. how, you know, what role death is going to play in your life. I mean, that's the whole Buddhist world is mm -hmm. about dealing, coming into a, a relationship with death. Yep. And, 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 and the Christian life as well is coming into a relationship with death. Now, I think that, that there are certain spiritual traces and uh, spiritual traditions that got it all wrong about, you know, it, if you don't follow me, your death is going to be a horrible experience. That, that to me is just completely misses the boat. It falls into that whole thing about power. Mm. Uh, but, but to me, it's it's how we recognize that no is a definition of the relationship. That but part of the you know it's it's this is the world we're going to live in because this is what they want to do, which may mean a no to me, but I'm free to choose who and where and when I want to be. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yep. And, yep. And, and so this comes back to, can I share with you what I am so excited about right now? Oh, please do. Yes. All right. So one of the things that I'm looking around at is this whole notion of agency and participation and, and livelihood and uh, really doing what I love doing. All right. Um, Dan Sullivan calls it my unique ability. And mm -hmm. if, if we say that every one of the 9 billion people in this world have a unique ability and that, that actually doing that gives them joy and highly product, uh, you know, highly uh, high productivity and it, it fills them with life. All right. So that's one. That's a, a just a, a, an awareness that I have. Now, what we've done in this entrepreneurial uh, operating system in EOS is we have taught people how to run great businesses. And that that's in a book called Traction. There's a new book out that uh, Gino wrote, and I had the privilege of being a reader, so I've been living with it for a year or two, and it's called The EOS Life. And this is the why, why you would be in business at all, or why to even, you know, how... It's, 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 it's the why we, we get up in the morning and it's five things. Doing what only what you love doing. And you're probably already living this life with people you love being with. Making a great contribution either to yourself, to your family, to your business, to the world through what you do. So doing only what you love doing with people you love, making a great contribution, getting compensated appropriately, and then finally having plenty of time left over for your passions, your family, and your other hobbies and things that are important to you. Now, that, you know, that's appealing to uh, business owners. And they get excited about, oh, you mean I don't have to work 90 hours a week and, you know, don't have to work with jerks anymore? That's the how in the traction book is that's true. We can help you with that. And, and so it worked, you know, it's very exciting for business owners. You can imagine that. And then the leadership teams pick up on that and they begin uh, enjoying that life. What I want to see is I want to see all of the 500 EOS implementers around the world getting businesses to understand that, if you, you have a problem with attracting the right people into your business, you have a tr trouble retaining the quality people, begin helping them to live the EOS life. Mm. And take that EOS life all the way through the entire organization so that your goal is when you get to your 10-year target, 100% of the people in your organization will be living the EOS life or have a path to it. Now, we are going to be, we are predicting that we will 
we will be implementing EOS in 100,000 businesses by 2030. Wow. And if you estimate, and just the average of employees in these businesses we work with is 50 employees, that's 5 million people, not even counting their families, right? Wow. But it, when we can, can migrate that, that whole notion of the EOS life, teach people how to do it, help them to understand that's what we want them to do, if they're not loving what their job is, let us help you find one either in this company or if not here, someplace else where mm -hmm. you are thriving, where you're bouncing out of the bed in the morning to come to work. Take that to those 5 million people and I think we'll change the world. I think that's amazing. Every year I pick a word that's like my word of the year. And for 2022, my word is impact. Impact. How, how much impact is what I'm doing this year? It was effective. Is what I'm doing effective or ineffective? If it's ineffective, cut the cord and move on. But right. for 2022, it's impact. Is what I'm doing having an impact? Because I too want it. I want to change. I want everyone on. I mean, my ultimate dream is that every person on the planet feels confident and comfortable and strong enough to ask for what they want, to literally yeah. articulate, this is what I want, and then providing them the tools to actually go and negotiate for it, to find it and to, and to get it. And, and it's all about impact. Is this making an impact? If it's not making an impact, I will be cutting cords and moving on and focusing on the things that are impactful. So I love what you, I love that vision. I love that vision, Will, because it is, it is all about impact. What are you doing to impact 5 million people in the next 19 years, 19 years? Yeah, 19 nine years. years. Nine, nine, nine years. years. Oh my God. I'm getting nine older. Years. Will, I'm getting there. I'm losing my mind. That's nine years, 5 million people in well, nine years. That's amazing. Math is all, math is all subjective, right? It so is. <laughs> what, what, what nobody, that, what the audience doesn't know is that we have this conversation about my biggest fight with my husband being over whether math was <laughs> objective or subjective. You'll have to hit both me or Will up to, to, to know what the answer to that one well, well, you know, just to give you a little sense of, of this a prediction that we have, 23 years ago, when Gino Wickman, the guy who wrote Traction and then wrote EOS Life, when he wrote on a, on a napkin that by 2020, this was 17 years, ago, 2020 would be 17 years from when he wrote it down. By 2020, we would have, have uh, implemented EOS through our implementers in 10,000 companies. December of 2020, we had 10,500 companies. Oh, that's so, awesome. Oh so my gosh, when, that's so powerful. Well, when now that we are saying we're predicting, this is not a goal, this is not a hope or a dream. This is a prediction because we've got it all planned out about how we're going to get there. And it's just one piece at a time. And what I'm excited about is all of us, all of the implementers making sure that, you know, it's really two or three, you know, it's like six to nine months into it because people start off with what's your 10 year target? Oh, $150 million. Oh, we're going to acquire all, ah, blah, 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 all these, but six to nine months in asking the question, how, how motivating is this 10 year target to the people who are turning the wrenches and sweeping the floors and pushing the buttons? Oh, well, it's probably not. Well, you know, I don't want to tell you, I would never tell you what to do, but could I dream with you a little bit? What do you think it would be like if you had, by the time we hit our 10 year target, 100% of the people in this organization will be living the EOS life or have a path to it. What do you think that would do for attraction of new people, retention of your best people and motivation for everybody? And it's just like their eyes get huge making the, the hope of gain better than the fear of loss. I absolutely. Mean, love it. Love and, and, it. And, 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 you know, they, they become, they absolutely become agents of change when they get that. Mm, that's, 
That's incredible. And you can't make an impact. You can't do that kind of impact without having others be agents of change, right? You, yeah. you have, you can't, can't do it alone. You got to do it with people. And that's yeah. just, that's just a beautiful vision. I love that. Well, I love it. Oh, well, it, it we're, we're going to do this. This is, I'm so excited about that. That's, that, that's what I'm spending the next three to five years. I mean, you know, my 20 clients for me is full. So I don't, and they stick around for at least two years. So that I don't need to generate thousands of, of, possibilities. But what I can do in the time that I'm not actually working on with my clients, and there's a lot of time that I'm not, is I can focus on letting people know the possibilities. Mm. And I mean, you know, when when you start doing that, you know, back in 2008, I mean, it's a wonderful book by a, a, a woman named uh, right here. Joan Williams, ah. called, called uh, the white working class. Now, what she's picked up on is she's saying they are now feeling what Native Americans have felt for 400 years. They're feeling what uh, you know Black Americans have felt as they're coming out of slavery over the past hundred years. And she's saying what happened in 2008 was when when the investors said to the CEOs of companies, look, you're pe the people that you want to talk about who are your employees, you got to stop thinking about them as people. They are now assets. And, and, and as an asset, they produce goods and services. Now, if we can find a place in the world where we can get 80% of the same quality for your goods and services at 50% or less of the cost. That's where this business is moving. Right? Yeah. And, and you saw where it happened. And, and what that did was that took all these businesses out of communities where they were the linchpin. They were the center. They were the culture of that of that community. Mm. These were people who lived and worked there and brought home food for the table. They they this was their world. And when that culture, that business left, nobody said to them, "Let us help you find the next job. Let us train you." In the same way, we didn't say it to the Native Americans or to the slaves that were now freed. It's the same thing. And an interesting until, point. I hadn't thought about that in that no, way. No, and, and until we can really recognize that, that we as investors, because you're in my investments, were mm -hmm. the people who were running those decisions, mm -hmm. they were doing it for us. But in doing that, it's like we hurt ourselves. But that, what I think is interesting about that, right? We're living in the great resignation, right? More people quit their jobs in in the last few months than in the history of this country yeah. at one point. Yeah. And I think that part of the great resignation is a, is simply a coming of age, so to speak, of people saying, I, I, I don't want to work for minimum wage 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week and not have health care and not be able to do the things I want to do and not live the life, not live a full life, just like the EOS life talks about and not yeah. live that world. I, why would I do that? Literally, why I, I was listening. I saw somebody post on my one of somebody on my Facebook posted some disparaging comment about employees not going back to work and and thinking this person thought is they're like, okay, it's because of unemployment. And I'm like, it's not about unemployment. It's like, because why would I come work for you? Why do I come bust your tables? Right. Why am I going to come bust your tables for less than minimum wage and fight for my tips, deal with crappy work environment. You don't work around my schedule when I have this amazing thing called a computer and the internet. Right. And I can connect and I can create something because I am unique 
I am re I, I'm realizing that I think I, I think I, I hate calling it the great resignation. It's the great awakening, in my opinion. We are becoming awakened to the fact that we have something of value to share with other people and we can make money doing it. So why would I go do something like that? Especially if the culture you've created for me is so negative that all I do is go into work and feel abused all the time. I want nothing to do with that. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, and, and I think it's all of us. It, it's it. We can't just say you did it to me. Mm -hmm. We all participated. In Absolutely. It. Yes, I we, agree. A hundred percent. I mean, the, the 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 wonderful story about the the uh, the the dishwasher in New York City, the you know restaurant dishwasher, and during COVID, he recognizes that he's got to take responsibility for his life, right? If he doesn't do something, he's not going to eat. His family's not going to eat. And, and if he doesn't take care of his health, COVID's not going to care about it. Right. And, and right. so he takes responsibility as one, just one model and goes out and learns cybersecurity. Exactly. And, and he's got a whole new world. But I think the reality is we're all waking up. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. You, you know, making money is not the most important thing. Nope. That has has brought us to our knees. And we're struggling with that. You know, there's some people who are awake and uh, know about it. They're aware of it. And there's others who are wanting to pretend that it's not there. And if we could only just go back to where, what? And go back to where us white guys were in charge and we really didn't pay attention to a lot of other folks, which is what brought us to where we are today. But if we can just recognize we're all in this together mm -hmm. and we're making it up and we can choose. And that's where I think your job is so important, just not only in negotiating, but helping people to recognize that, that we are not trying to convince somebody. We're trying to build a relationship, which means we have to have these negotiation tools. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, negotiation is a conversation. It's a conversation about your relationships and you can't win relationships. So stop trying to win them, <laughs> work on building them, growing yeah. them, right? Deepening Let them, them blossom, right? And, yeah. and create that space that allows not only you for you to grow, but for your counterparts to grow too. I mean, you've been married for what, 44 years and I've been married for almost 30, right? Our relationships, I guarantee grow because not only are we, a, are, is my, is my husband and I a couple, we're, I mean, certainly we're a couple, but we're individuals first and we've flourished as individuals and that flourishing as individuals allows us to flourish as a couple. And our business relationships, in my opinion, are the exact same thing. We are individual companies, but when we come together and we have common ground and we build on that common ground, we allow each other to flourish as individual companies, and then we flourish together and we are able to participate in more. We're able to create more and gain more and participate in it together. And, and that's, that's where we're going as a country is to get on the same page, to get on the common ground, to get clear about where do we want to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be in the same place we're right now. Right. Yeah. We've got some growing to do, and it's not going to be one side or any one of the multiple sides winning. Mm -hmm. It's really going to be us developing relationships of respect and curiosity and and uh, recreation, joy, and high productivity. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. I agree. Well, this has been great, Christine. Just just one awesome. more one more conversation that will be many. <laughs> I this has been amazing. It's been such an honor to be be here with you and to be here with the audience. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. Well, if somebody wanted to have a conversation with somebody right now that is finding it very difficult and they thought you could help them, how would they get in touch with you? 
So the easiest way, and well, you can find me on LinkedIn if you just look Christine McKay. I've been on LinkedIn for eternity, so I'm the only, I'm the first Christine McKay that should come up. Um, and uh, and you can always go check out our website at Venn Negotiation. And for those of you who loved math in high in in school, that is the Venn diagram. So it's the three circle Venn diagram is our is our logo. Um, so Venn and Negotiation. So it has three ends in it. VennNegotiation.com. All right, Christine. It as as usual. It's been a wonderful conversation. Likewise. Thank you so much, Will. All righty. Just another example of how businesses will thrive and continue to thrive, not only in California, but all around the country. You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. 